You may be seated this morning if you like. And, you know, just to be a part and to bless them, uh, those children with, uh, with school supplies and all kinds of things. And, and uh, we're just excited about being a part of our community. You know, as I was thinking about the offering this morning, when Jesus fed the 5,000, the disciples came to him and they said, Lord, should we just let them go so that they can go find provision and food for themselves? But Jesus said to them, no, you give them to eat. And so this morning, uh, we are called upon to bless people and to help provide some basic needs for people. So we're going to be feeding close to 500 people uh, this coming weekend. And God has called us to do that. So don't say... Let them go, but say, we're going to be a part of blessing the kingdom. Amen. And, and uh, I believe that when we do that, that God is faithful to us. I don't, I don't believe it. I know it. I've experienced. Amen. Uh, that when we're faithful to God, that he always supplies and meets every need. So uh, let's pray over the offering this morning as we receive it. I am thankful for a group of people who uh, know how to give and are called to give, and so God, just bless you and multiply uh, everything that you have that you might uh, be blessed and be able to be a blessing. Father God, we thank you for this day and all that you are doing, Lord. We pray that, God, you would be our provider. We know that you are. God, move in a mighty way. Touch and bless your people, God. Enlarge their territory. God, increase their borders. Lord, we ask that you would put your hand upon them, God. And that they might be able to just be a part of enlarging and enhancing your kingdom. We give you the praise and the glory for it in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. How do you get 500 people here? One at a time, but you got to invite them. Amen. That means five times the number of people that attend here. A little over five times the number of people that attend right. here on a regular basis. That means you need to grab four people and bring them with you. Amen. Do that. Invite people from the community. Invite your neighbors. Invite your family so that we as a church can bless them. Amen? Amen. We promise that you can park at the Lewis Walton Park. <laughs> We're going to have parking. It's going to be down there and around the community, around the church in different places. At the Church of God parking lot. Church of God well. parking lot across the street. Bring people with you. Amen. Bring them so that you can bless them. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun things for kids to do. So if there's kids in your neighborhood, make sure you tell them to come out. I think they have a bouncy house in a slide. Two, two different or, Something filled with air. There's going to be two of them. Slide. Plus games. And so there's lots of fun stuff for kids to do. Um, so you tell everyone to come on out and enjoy uh, the event so that we can bless the community around us. We've got to get the community here in order to bless them. So let's right. do that. Stand with us for one more time of uh, praise and worship. Yeah. 
it says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Chronicles chapter 16 says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Yes. His mercy endures forever. Ezra 3.11 says, For he is good, and his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Psalms 25 says, Good and upright is the Lord. Psalms 23.6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalms 145 says, The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. Mark 10 says, No one is good but one, and that is God. James chapter 1 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Matthew 7 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Psalms chapter 27 says, I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God is good. Over and over and over in the scriptures, you hear that God is good and his mercy will endure forever. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We serve a God that is sovereign. He is unchanging. He is continual. And if God would do it, then he will do it now. God is so good. And today we come into this church building together as a solemn assembly to declare God is good. We are raising our hands to him. We are worshiping him. We are not just here entertaining ourselves. And this is a great place to come and sing and practice our singing. That's not what we're here for. We're here to lift our voices to God and praise and worship. And if you don't have anything to worship about, I'm going to you today worship him because he is good. Yes, yes, yes. Our Christian faith is founded on the fact that he is good. Everything that he does is for the increase of his kingdom and for our good. Yes. He does nothing in your life that is not for your good. He is good to you. We may not like everything that happens, but God does everything that he does for our good. And today, let's worship him. Oh, 
that podcast for the book of Jonah. And in the book of Jonah, God calls Jonah to a work. And Jonah says, nope, I'm not going to do it. And he tries to hide from the presence of God. The same thing Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. I'm trying to hide from God. I don't want him to see me. So he got on a boat and he went out and he ended up getting thrown overboard because he was the reason that there was a storm and the boat was going to sink and terrible things were going to happen. And when he fell overboard, God said, I'm not done with you yet. And he caused a big fish to swallow him. You see, Jonah was running from God, but God ran toward Jonah. He didn't stop. God will not stop running after you. He loves you and he has purpose for you and he's going to run toward you no matter where you go, no matter what corner of the earth you run to, no matter what closet you try to hide in, no matter where you are at, God will pursue you and he will run after you. Now we can choose the, the path of the big fish we can choose to run towards God and what he has for us. I choose to run towards God. I have to tell you, I don't want to be in the belly of the fish if I can help it at all. I want to run towards the loving arms of my Father.
answered those prayers from you all, yes. from the whole district. You were my lifeline. And when I sent out an email asking people to pray, specifically at times during her brain radiation, there were so many of you that did. And you cannot, I cannot explain to you how much that meant to this mom's heart. We put, we put, I wrote scriptures and we stuck them in her jean pocket and she took them with her and we declared that that radiation was anointed by the Holy Spirit and it was. She is doing fantastic. She's a walking miracle.
found an orange tie, I said, throw it away. <laughs> I mean, I just tell you, you are an orange. Uh, don't mean to offend anybody if you're an orange, but uh, but I uh, I just, uh, I had a UK room down there, not because of the education, because of the athletics, and just the fact that it's named Kentucky. Uh, and we'll uh, make sure we do that. One of the other guys that uh, will be kind of associated with is a Michigan State fan, and so we have a lot of dialogue during basketball season, uh, back and forth uh, with that. But it is good, and again, I certainly appreciate all that this church has done for us over these past almost 18 years. Uh, appreciate the office space that you've given us at the district and, and all the support, uh, both prayer support, financial support, participation. Uh, you're just a special church and a special group of people, and we, we want to thank you from the depth of our heart. So in the early service, uh, I mean, this is our first day was here. I spared no expense. <laughs> After service, we went to McDonald's. And, uh, <clears throat> that's all there was. That's all there was. That was Lexington. Uh, but, uh, but there was just a lot of memories here, and, and we certainly uh, treasure those and appreciate uh, all of you. I do want to thank you for uh, yesterday. was kind of an unscheduled day, and uh, I was supposed to have picked up a U-Haul to load up the office at 10 o'clock in the morning which did not happen, and then finally at 4 o'clock they said we have a truck for you, and all you guys have responded to help us load that, and I really appreciate it. They all the work. Bill's the engineer, he says, here it is, you know, put it here, put it there. Jason has been such a help to us over this period, and Jason and Becky did a tremendous job at youth camp last week. Thank you. with each and every one of us 
in this congregation today. Amen. God calls us into relationship. Now, there are certain aspects about a call. First of all, the call sometimes is gradual. Sometimes it is simply just by revelation that it happens and certain things occur. I remember one time I had a friend, and I've shared this before, uh, when I was in grad school, and he would come in. He was, he was a Vietnam veteran. And uh, he would come into my room, and he would always have a cigarette in this hand and a bottle of, or a can of Coke in this hand. And he'd always walk in and say, well, Raver, you're a pretty good guy if it just wasn't for all this religious stuff. <laughs> and... Uh, and he would talk, and he said, you know, if God would just speak out of heaven and say, Don, he said, I would respond to him. There was nothing I wouldn't do. If God would just speak to me. And then he would say, well, you know, I left the classroom today, and I went, and there were some Gideons trying to give me a Bible. <laughs> he said, I went on across campus, and here was somebody, a group of people having the guitar and singing these religious songs. And then another thing that happened where he had somehow had encountered Christians. And I said, Don, how much does God have to talk to you? God has already talked to you three times today. But sometimes we, are, we deny what is God is trying to do because we do not want to hear and accept the call. But the call of God most of the time is not a gradual call. It is a spontaneous call. It is a spontaneous call. Matthew did not wake up that morning and decide he was going to go to his normal job, sit at the receipt of custom, and said, man, I can't wait because Jesus is going to come by and call. No, that wasn't what happened. He woke up and he went about the normal routine of his life, the normal routine that, uh, he, that he was used to, and then all of a sudden something spontaneous happened. Jesus came by. I want you to know that Jesus don't just come by. Come because when Jesus comes by, there is an interaction between God and man. Yeah. And he looked down to Matthew. And he didn't ask Matthew about his family. He didn't ask how he was feeling. He didn't ask what his favorite hobby was. He didn't ask him what the weather was. He didn't ask him what, uh, anything about his likes or dislikes. He simply said, follow me. Now, sometimes, again, those calls are, are most of the time are spontaneous. One day, there was a man sitting around his house, kind of enjoying his family and just enjoying the resources that was there, and God spoke to him. And he said, Abraham, he said, leave. I want you to literally just get up and leave. Sometimes, those spontaneous moments are sudden calls, sudden encounters with Christ. Abraham was not expecting God that day to come and to share with him and to call him. But God had another plan, and God came and said, Abraham, go. Moses and Paul experienced the call of God through supernatural manifestations. Moses all of a sudden saw the, uh, the burning bush and, here, and began to approach it and had an encounter with God. Paul on the Damascus Road had an encounter with God. God manifested himself in such a way that they knew it was God and there was a need for response. David, in the time that he was called, he was one that had a, a separation in a sense from his family. He was the young guy. He was the youngest. He was not even significant enough to be called when the prophet came. And he began, the prophet began to look for someone there to anoint as the next king of Israel. Of course, we know the story. Jesse said, he asked Jesse, don't you have someone else? He said, well, as a matter of fact, there's one that he's very insignificant. He's out there with the sheep. God says, bring him in. And when he came in, what happened was that the prophet anointed him yeah. as a teenager, yeah. anointed him as the king of Israel. Sometimes we know that we are called by the anointing that is upon our life. Sometimes we recognize callings because of God's grace manifested in, in our hearts, our lives, and in our interaction with individuals. Sometimes we simply know that there is something special about what God is trying to do within us. 
And other times there is simply an invitation. Jesus walked by, and here were these disciples, these men that were doing their trade. It wasn't their hobby. It was how they received their livelihood, and that was by fishing. And then Jesus walked by, and he gave them an invitation, and he said, Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Sometimes the call of God comes by invitation. And then other times it literally comes by how Matthew received it. And that is a command. Matthew, follow me. There wasn't any other thing around it. It was just simply the words, follow me. So the call of God is, number one, spontaneous. The other thing about the call of God is that it is life-altering. It changes your life. Life was never be the same. Abraham left all. He turned around. He left his family. He left his livelihood. He left all the security that he knew to go to a place that he didn't know, to do something he didn't even know what he was going to do, to be something he didn't even know what he was going to be. But all he knew was that God had spoken to him. Folks, there is nothing more important than hearing the voice of God. When you hear the voice of God, there is that response, but there is also that life-altering moment. Moses, hearing the call of God, no longer was a shepherd on the backside of the desert, tending his father's sheep. But no longer was David just a neglected one in his family. No longer were the disciples simply just fishermen, but they arose and followed him. And then Matthew came, and he arose, and he followed him. Now let's look at that. Matthew arose and he followed him. But Matthew did something else. Matthew made a repentance and an amends to those whom he had offended and done wrong. Matthew was a tax collector. He was required to, re to receive taxes for the government. But then on the side, he would kind of lifted the percentage a little bit for his own gain. And when he came to this moment in time, there was a transformation that happened in his life but also happened in his relationship with those whom he had offended. There are some times when we hear the call of God that we have to go back and we have to make a recompense for those that we have done wrong. Sometimes there is a confession. Sometimes there is the request for forgiveness. Sometimes there is restitution if we have done something wrong. But folks, I want you to know that that is a way that we establish the foundation that we can truly be free to follow the call of God. We do not come into relationship and carry baggage with us. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. When we confess our sin and receive him as Lord, there is also the need to where we begin to break down any barriers that would hinder the walk of God and the calling of God upon our hearts and upon our lives. For Paul, it was a life-altering moment. Here was a man that was going out and trying to kill Christians and destroy the church. And now because of this life-altering moment, he began to go and began to speak life in the dead souls and began to proclaim the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, when we receive the call, we, it is this life-altering moment when we respond. And it requires an immediate response. It does. You know, we talk about hearing God's voice and we say, well, you know, maybe I ought to think about it. Well, when you think about it, you're delaying and you're trying to avoid it. The call of God is simply, you know, the command to rise and follow him. Now, if you've ever been in the military and someone that is superior to you says, we're going to go here today and this is what we're going to do. You don't look at that person and say, well, let me think about it. You don't look to the drill sergeant and say, well, I'll tell you what, I had other plans today. I wanted to go down and go fishing in the pond. You don't do that. Right. What do you do? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. We respond to what that call or what that direction is yeah. from someone in authority. Who has more authority than God? Come on, right? Come on. <laughs> Who has more authority? When God speaks to our lives, he speaks to us with purpose. He speaks to us with a transforming moment 
to be able to make our, our life altering, but be able to respond immediately Amen. to what God is calling us to do. Amen. The call to salvation. You know, when people, uh, when we ask people if they've received Christ, and they say, well, let me think about it. What they're saying is, I don't think I want to do that. I just want to be polite. Uh -huh. God doesn't want politeness. God wants obedience. Amen. God doesn't want us to just dwell. God wants us to exceed and do, do that that he has called us to do. And so it requires an immediate response. And there's also a call to action. A call to move. God calls. God prepares through your obedience to apply the opportunity that God gives you. Now, of course, I've worked with ministers a lot, almost all of my ministry. I've worked with those, and I've heard those people say, well, God called me, and God's going to prepare me. Well, God will prepare you if you will allow him to prepare you. You say, well, I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to be able to just come and pray and ask Christ into my heart, and I'm going to be able to, God's going to help me to be able to succeed and do this and do that. And God will if you apply the opportunities that God gives you for spiritual growth, spiritual discipline, and be able to realize that we live in relationship, not only with God, but we live in relationship with one another. Amen. God's, the word says that not forsake the assembling of yourselves. Yes. Why? Because in the group, there is power. Yes. In the group, there is relationship. Yes. In the group, there is encouragement. Yes. In the group, there is intercessory prayer time. Yes. In the group, there is the caring and the prayers that come in the moment of crisis. In the group, there is the spiritual growth in the Word through yeah. our Bible studies and through being able to grow in the Word and in relationship with one another and with God. God gives us the opportunity to be able to be trained and be effective. But it is up to us to be able to apply ourselves to those opportunities that God sets before us and gives us. Abraham built an altar. Number one, if we're going to hear the call of, or receive the call of God and move forward, we've got to have time with God. Moses spent time in the wilderness and up in the mountain alone with God. All alone with God, David served, disciples followed. There has to be that continual interaction and relationship with God and ourselves. God calls us to move. And then God calls us to service. God calls us to service because Abraham became the father. God does not call us without purpose. God does not call us without purpose. God does not call us to simply just be followers. He calls us to be disciples. He calls us to be overcomers. He calls us to be empowered by the presence of his Holy Spirit. He calls us to be in relationship with him and with each other. And so there is the call of service. The disciples, of course, called into the upper room filled with the Holy Spirit. And there at that moment in time when it looked like darkness was, was circulating around the church and the church was over because he had died and been placed in the grave and they said it was over with. Some of them discounted and didn't believe in the resurrection, didn't believe in the ascension. But on the day of Pentecost, these disciples experienced the power of God and the presence of God manifested by the Holy Spirit. And through that empowerment, they were able to be able to receive not only the call, but the call to action and the service in building the church of the living and the almighty God. Also, it is a call to sacrifice. I know in Pentecostal service, when we say it's called a sacrifice, it means we're taking up an offering. <laughs> well, I got three ha-ha's. Uh, but it's more than that. Amen. There is financial sacrifice, but it's not a sacrifice. Right. So what are you talking about? Because it's not a, when my girls come to me and say, you know, I need this or I need that, it wasn't a sacrifice for me. That's right. I wanted to because they're my girls. I love them. When Mimi gives me that look, it's not a sacrifice Amen. because I love her. And we'll do everything we can to be able to respond to what she needs or what she desires. 
And so when we're, when we're called to sacrifice, it's not a sacrifice if we're truly in relationship with God and walking with right. Him. Right. But God does call us to sacrifice because we have to remember that the main thing is the main thing. The relationship with God is the main thing. It's a call to obey. Now, sometimes sacrifice, we sacrifice through obedience. I like to sleep. God says, I want you to pray. I like to eat. God says, I want you to fast. I like to be able to sit down, hopefully this year, a new championship, you know, in, the, in the sports. And God says, no, I need you to go preach. Sometimes it is a sacrifice of our own self, our own desires, of our own wishes to be able to obey the call of God. Yes. And the other thing about the call of sacrifice is it a walk of faith. Faith is something we can't see. We just know that it's there. Sometimes we take, we take steps into what we consider darkness, but when we take those steps into the darkness, we find the light of heaven guiding and directing us. And so sometimes it is a call to be able to walk by faith, and it's a call to give our time. Sometimes it's a call to delay our future or change our future goals and perceptions because we have these things in mind and all of a sudden God says, I have something else in store. And being able to lay aside those things that we perhaps have treasured, and those goals that we have treasured, and realizing that the call of God brings us to a higher level of challenges but also a higher level of blessings and impact on the, in, the, in the world that we live in today. It's called a sacrifice. Is it a sacrifice to do something for someone you truly love? Is it a sacrifice to do something that is truly a calling, a passion, a purpose that God has given unto us? Well, sometimes it is. I shared in the air of the service, there was a young couple that graduated from Bible college just a couple of years before me. And they left everything and went to Indonesia as missionaries. And part of the reason that they had to go so quickly was that we had a couple there that had been there, I think, for 26 years. And they had never come home on furlough. Normally our missionaries will go for, I think, three or four years and come back a year to help raise funds, supplement their, uh, their financial base to be able to go back and continue their ministry. Brother and Sister Parsons never left Indonesia because they were afraid if they did, they couldn't get back in the country because they couldn't get their visas. And they chose to stay and sacrifice because they wanted to be able to truly fulfill the call of God, fulfill the call of God into that country. Fred and Joni Duncan left and they went there to relieve them and stayed again for, I think, for two tours. Being able to minister in Indonesia is one of our greatest works today because of the sacrifice that people made. Folks, the main thing, the main thing is our relationship with God. The main thing is impacting the lives of those that we come in contact with with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The main thing is being able to share with one another what God has done for us, what God is doing for us, and what God's plan is for us as we follow Him. Again, the call of God is not just a calling for pulpit ministry. It is a calling of relationship. It's a call of relationship. You remember when God spoke to you and said, I want you to save me. I want you to confess your sins. I want you to become a part child being a child of God and all of a sudden we just knew that the Lord was tugging in our hearts and we said yes Lord I'm yours sometimes the call of God is not again just for a pulpit ministry the call of God is to feed 500 people to be able to reach out to a community and be able to bring light into darkness to be able to minister to children to where the children can look at this church and know that there's someone something that cares about them and 
that they can feel safe and secure in being able to come here and worship God. The call of God is so diverse that he calls us from different locations and sometimes different areas of life because all that we do is ministry. If you're a doctor and you're called to be a doctor, you're in ministry. If you're called to be a school teacher, you're a school teacher. Being able to reach the lives and touch the young people that you're teaching, that is a call. That's an opportunity in ministry. Amen. In every vocation, it is an open door to be able to reach the lost, encourage the Christian, and to see the work of God go forward see the work of God go forward. This morning, before we transition into service of ordination, I want to just invite you this morning. If you're here in this congregation and you, you feel a call, God's tugging at your heart. You've never known Him as Savior before, but there's something going on inside. You might not even know what it is, but perhaps it's God trying to call you out of darkness into light. God calling you out of despondency and despair into glory. Call you into relationship with Him. If you're here this morning and you're feeling that little tug in your heart, I want to invite you to come and we'll pray with you. There's nothing more important than somebody responding to the call of God. If you're here today and you're feeling that tug in your heart, feeling that move in, that you've never experienced before, or hearing that voice perhaps that you've never heard before. I invite you to come.